The good news is NFL is here with the playoffs. It's exciting and it's electrifying. The bad news, the Dallas Cowboys are on vacation already because they're not playing. They're watching the playoffs somewhere around the world, you know, somewhere in Hawaii, some, somewhere. They're, they're going to be somewhere already on vacation. Um, the other Texas team that was supposed to be on the playoffs, not to remind you, but they lost last night also. Did I use the word painfully? I didn't use the word painfully, right? But they were just killed last night. But, 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 but here's what I want you to think for a moment, because, you know, sports, obviously, it's a culture, sh it shapes the culture of our community and, and our country, obviously. Um, I, I don't know how you perceive that, ladies. I, I know for some of you, uh, probably, it's like, you know, you, you walk into the room and he is focused on that thing, and we, we don't multitask, so we're literally focused on this thing, right? Um, and, 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 and for me, I still remember, I still remember, this is the year 1999. I was pastoring First Baptist in Port Isabel, and we took our student ministry to the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. This is July. If I'm, not if I'm not mistaken, it's probably the 14th or 16th of July. I don't remember the exact date, and I could have Googled that. But on that evening, that Friday, that we were in the Alamo Dome, this is 1999, that was the evening that the San Antonio Spurs won their first championship in New York. Not in the Alamo Dome. We were in the Alamo Dome. We were having this... Um, this evangelism conference with about 16,000 students from across the, the state of Texas. And I remember that evening because we are going through the entire evening experience in the Alamo Dome, 16,000 people, and they literally stopped the conference. And suddenly, the lights went off in the Alamo Dome. And they went live on the big screens the moment the Spurs won. So for me, that was kind of the closest experience of a celebration of a championship. And then the coyote, which is the mascot of the Spurs, actually walked on center stage. And he was with the big old flag right live uh, celebrating, you know, the, the, the victory. Now, I thought in my mind that, that this is really cool. For me, it was electrifying. 16,000 kids, you know, students just going crazy because the Spurs won. 1999. Size 30 black hair. It was, it was good. Good old days. Good old days. Until, until two years ago, I went to Germany to baseball camp. And on that evening in Germany, the World Cup took place and they beat Argentina. Now, I thought this was cool. I thought 1999 was a landmark for me. No, sir. No. This was something else. Needless to say, this is a more global sport. But Germans, Germans go a little crazy and wild when it comes to celebrating a World Cup. And they won. And we were there the evening they won. So, so what I want you to think for a moment with me, because again, this is where we're going for the next few minutes. I want you to think about this experience of following Christ and the core values of our church. The message that we began last week of Matthew chapter 16, if you have a Bible, pull it out, please. Matthew chapter 16, and also pull out your handout from your bulletin. It has to do with the context of a playoff finals experience. What does that mean? Think about it for a moment. When you are in the finals, and by the way, the Cincinnati Bengals last night, they, they lost to uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And if I'm not mistaken, I didn't watch the game. They had one of those kind of moments at the end of the game that the whole season came to one single play, one single event. I want you to think about this. The interview, the conversation between Jesus and the disciples is in the context of a play of experience. This is it. There is no tomorrow. There, there is no next season, especially in football. If you know anything about sports, in football, it's very difficult to keep teams intact. It's difficult. So literally, when you go to the playoffs and you possibly go to the Super Bowl, there is very small possibility you can repeat or go back. So literally, is, this is it. There is, no, there is no tomorrow, whether you win or you go home. That's the context of the conversation between Jesus and the disciples. This is the moment where Jesus, as we said last week, Jesus approaches the disciples and he basically says, who do people say that I am? 
This is playoff time. This is test time. This is, this is no more teaching time. I've been teaching you. I've been discipling you. I've been with you. I've been walking with you, performing miracles before you. I've been sharing my life with you. And this is it. There's nothing else. That's the context of our conversation. Now, one thing that I want to remind you based on what we said yesterday, because this is, this is why we spend time in Matthew today. Not only that this is crunch time, that this is playoff time, intensity. Uh, for some reason, Jesus brings this conversation. Like when you're going through a final test, if you remember those days in school, final test, final examinations, um, Jesus is not giving like a scantron and doing multiple choices. Jesus is testing the disciples with one single question. Now, the other thing that makes it tough or difficult, not only is that one single question, but the other thing is that, think about the context. I read to you last week, beginning on verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, up to verse 5, and the context is really demoralizing. The religious leaders, they have been on a mission to take down this man by Jesus. Every single opposition possible has been against Jesus as a person. Like personally, they want, last week I told you, because they came to him, Pharisees and Sadducees, and said, show us a sign from heaven. And Jesus replies and calls him, you are a wicked and adulterous generation. The only sign you will receive, he says, is the sign of Jonah. And we'll go to that in just a minute. But then the other thing that makes it so difficult to be tested by Jesus in this context, if you are a disciple, is that not only that everything is moving against you, but Jesus keeps on saying or talking about his death. He keeps announcing that he is going to die. And if you are a disciple and this is your leader and, and you're supposed to have the restoration of the people of God reflurry, I mean, the promises of Old Testament take place, you don't want this man to die. It's like, we have seen so many Jews died. Well, why are you talking about your death? No more of this. See, the other thing, and again, this is from last week. If you remember, Jesus warned them and says, do not let the yeast of the Pharisees contaminate you. That adulterous, that, uh, you know, wicked mindset. And, uh, and the disciples didn't get it. So Jesus replies to them and says, hey, you are men of little faith. You don't get it. You still don't get it. So, so you have a lot of stuff going on against the disciples passing the test. See, this morning... I believe many of us, we come into a place like this with a lot of tests, with a, with a lot of things going on in our lives that they're not working favorably towards us. We may be in this place because this is the place to be, but our hearts are struggling because what happened this week, maybe 2016 is the year where we are even struggling to move things beyond where we have been. So, so today what I want to do, I want us to think about the good news of the gospel. I'll just give you a little bit of a bad framework. Here's the good news of this. If you were here last week, the answer that Peter is going to give Jesus by saying, and we're going to read this in a minute, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, you are Messiah. Jesus' replied is what makes the difference. Now, please listen to me for a moment. See, the test <clears throat> is the question. The answer is extremely important. And upon Peter's answer, Jesus replies and says the following. Even though everything is moving against the movement that I have launched, that I have begun, everything is against, okay? Everything, Jesus makes a statement, and this is from last week. He says, I will build my church. The moment that Jesus says, I will build it, is the moment that the disciples are going to be challenged to take and to believe with certainty that when Jesus speaks, things come into place. So if, if you and I are in a place where maybe everything is moving against us, even, even this week, I was talking to one of our church leaders uh, and, and just bringing this conversation last night, actually. Yeah, last night, actually. And, and we were talking about trends, what is predicted for our beautiful United States of America and even the world. But let's begin here in America. It is predicted, the trends of 2016 in church life is that one out of three, a third of churches in the United States will close this year. Think about it. 
In my mind, you know what I thought when I thought about this, this declining of the church? And when I said the declining, the guy, which we give him the report, he's talking about the decline of the church, and one out of three will close and shut down. Obviously, these churches, they have been on a plateau and decline already stage. It's not just suddenly going to happen. Um, the good news of that report is that those churches that will close this year, they will give their facilities to growing churches. And they will become satellite churches, extension campuses, or they will just retake the church and rebirth, reborn a church in that place. So I guess that's the good news. But here's what I, in my mind what I thought. If one out of three are going to close, in my mind, I thought of my three children because I have three kids. And I thought, okay, I have three kids. So if one of the three didn't make it, one of the three got lost, one of the th three was never saved, how will I react to that? And I'm saying this because many of us, when we hear trends of church, we think of organizations, which we are an organism. But let me just put it to you very closely. See, the conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples, please listen to me. Look, look at me for a second. He is not having the conversation in the context that you and I think of the word church. See, many of us, we think church, and we think of Sunday morning, which I'm glad you're here. We think church, and we think of vacation Bible school that you and I probably grew up going to. We think about church, and we think of a place that we come and gather with a building like this. See, this is not what they're talking about. This is not the context of congregation. I love the fact that Jesus pulls the disciples to, this, to the side, very intimate conversation, and asks this final question. Test time. It's in the context of intimacy that Jesus conveys this beautiful conversation. And I'm just bringing this up to you and I because many of us, we can potentially be in love with the church and forget about the husband of the church. Many of us, we can be so focused on what I believe the church should be that we can potentially get to the place, and this has happens to all of us, we can potentially believe that the building or the growing or the success of the church depends totally on us. And Jesus says, I will build my church. Now the question comes is, how is he going to do this? Well, I'm going to let you ask. So I'm going to tell you how he does it. The disciples don't know. The disciples are struggling. The disciples, I mean, you know the passage in chapter 16, right uh, after the, the verses we're going to read, um, Jesus announces his death. And this is the conversation with Peter, the same Peter that Jesus called him, blessed are you, Peter, son of uh, uh, Jonah. Uh, uh, he is also the same Peter. Jesus says, get behind me. What's the word? Satan. Which in my mom thinking, see, that's exactly me. That, that's me. There, there are some days that I'm just, yeah, and then some days like, hey, you're just, you're not, you're not doing it right, bro. Have you been there? Or do you have some days that you're like, yeah, and then, uh, huh, I need help. Am I saved? You know, it's like, you know, anyhow, I, I just love, I love how the scripture portrays this message in this regard. So how do you, how do you believe, how do you base your trust and your relationship to the church on the certainty and the person of Jesus. Because again, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just struggling sometimes on us understanding what is it that we do and how we do this. Well, again, if you are visiting and you are coming back to our church, we as a church, if you look at this uh, uh, handout, um, we have basically three core values and we embrace the love for God, the love for others, and the love for the world. And if you're going to believe the certainty of the words of Jesus saying, I will build my church i will build it it's not that hopefully when things change then i will build it hopefully when you disciples get it i will build it He'll, hopefully when things change here in jerusalem i will build it he makes a statement i will build how do you take the words of jesus when things are not changing when he keeps on saying something but then everything looks exactly the opposite well here's how the conversation began between them verse 13 when jesus came to the region of caesarea philippi he, Jesus, as the disciples, and says, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the key part for me, if you have a Bible and you like to underline your Bible, is to underline the word Son of Man. Because this is, this is the reference, this is the most common reference that Jesus uses about himself. This is what he called himself. Now, if you were here in the past, or maybe the, the Christmas series, you remember me bringing the pretzel. The reason why Jesus uses the phrase, the Son of Man, is because this is the connotation from Old Testament to New Testament that describes the, the 
the collision, the experience, not necessarily of subtraction, but addition to the 100% man, 100% God. I explained this to you for basically five weeks in December on the incarnation of Jesus, but let me just remind you one single thing. When Jesus walked among us, and we embrace the concept that he is God himself, it's not that he was a man and they added his humanity. It was that to his divinity, his humanity was added to it. Do I need to say that again? I'm going to say that one more time. Listen to me for a second. It's not that his humanity just got some divine thing going on in him. In other words, what, what I, Jesus wasn't simply a magician that walked three feet above the ground and went just performing miracles because he was divine. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm listening to your thoughts. No, that, that's not Jesus. See, Jesus was God simply put into a human form. So he never lost his essence as a God or as the God of the scriptures. So what does that mean? Well, here, here's the implication because you've got to remember, for us to say, to say, thus says the Lord, for us to say this is what the Bible says, you have to know the authors, which in this case is Matthew, Matthew's original intent, and you have to know and understand what the audience understood of what Matthew said. If you don't understand those things, I don't believe you can say, thus says the Lord. Now look at me for a second. I am not implying that you are not able to hear from God. Yes, you are able to hear from God, even if you don't know those two things. But all that I'm saying is that if you don't know what the author meant, said, and meant, and you don't know what the recipients understood from what the author said and meant, then it becomes devotional reading. That means that God is speaking to you, and I'm all for God is speaking to you. But if you're going to make people, all the people, accountable to what you think the Bible is saying, you better do your homework. Anybody tracking? So with that in mind, think about what we're saying. If Jesus calls himself the son of man. He's calling himself, I am the son of man. Who do people say the son of man is? Who do people say that me, being God made flesh, who am I supposed to be? I, I love this question. Because, see, the answer to this question in the context of this Jewish voice called the disciples, it has to do with the concept that this man grew up in monotheism. One God. Only one God. So it's very challenging for them, just philosophically, intellectually, emotionally, to think and to believe that if you are calling yourself the son of man, which is the implication of this collision, not of subtraction, by addition, that you are God and you simply added this flesh to you, it's going to be almost impossible for me as a Jewish boy to think, to think and to believe that God, the God of the Old Testament, can potentially be crucified huh anybody think about it the god of the old testament is going to be crucified that, that that's a mind-blowing concept for these people so in this experience what, what i want you to understand is if you're going to believe that jesus is building or will build his church and jesus has built his church for the last two thousand years has to begin with the character of jesus with what he says about himself i personally don't believe listen to me I don't believe you and I can know, can understand the character of Jesus without the first core value. See, the core value is based on love, the love you, you have for God. So, so in my mind, here, here's just my simplistic way of putting things. I love marriage, but I did not choose Areli so I can avoid singleness. Anybody tracking? I'm going to say that one more time. I love marriage. I did not choose my wife so I can stop being single. Marriage is simply means to an end. What's the end? It's a woman. I want that girl. I wanted that girl 18 years ago, and I went after that girl. So it's about the person. It's not about just the institution, what we do here, how we function. All of this is important. It's about the person. So how do you know the person? How do you know the character of the person? Well, here's what you need to understand. is that worship... For you to know and, and connect to the character of God is not avoiding false religions. It's about embracing the 200% men. Jesus is not simply 100% men. He's 200% men. Why? Because it's not simply a man that had divine authority, divine characteristics, divine essence added to it. It was God. This is God himself who became men. Anybody tracking? So this is why he becomes the 200 
percent men and my question to you and I here is where the whole conversation begins if you are in this place and you come to the realization that all you need is to hear the voice of God you're holding on to the promises there is no way these promises are going to become a reality if you do not know him and that's what he's saying who do people say the son of man is well it's interesting that the answers are pretty Pretty, I mean, come on, think about it. Look at John the Baptist. That's what people are saying about you, son of men. Uh, Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, and then some of the prophets. So, so let me put it to you very simple because we're going to close our time this morning. On your handouts, I want you to see the difference that the common denominator of these answers have to do with resusc resuscitation. Those are experiences of individuals that, especially the prophets, that they will resuscitate. They had the ability, they, some of them will resuscitate. See, when it comes to the Son of Man, it's not a resuscitation. See, resuscitation is when somebody loses the vital signs and is declared dead. And the person, through medical experience, through miraculous, I mean, whatever the case may be, whatever it means, they're brought back to life. Resurrection is a different ball game. And Jesus separates from the resuscitation experience to the resurrection. And the resurrection implies not only that you were dead and you're brought back to life. Please listen, listen to me for a second. The difference between being resuscitated versus resurrected is when you resurrect, which is our promise. This is why he's a son of men. It's because when you come back from the dead, you come with a glorified body. And I'm just telling you right now, the Bible is not going to give you any details, so please do not ask me any questions on that issue. All that I'm going to say is this. This is my perspective of this resuscitation, resurrection thing. Just as your body was designed to live in this, in this world, we're able to breathe, we're able to eat, we're able to rest, we're able to have our senses. I believe, this is just my take, that this resurrected body that we will eventually adopt and take when he returns again, it's going to be a physical body that will be designed for that place. That, that's all that I know. Now, more details. There's no more details in the Bible about what and how and how this works. But when Jesus resurrected, he physically walked among his people. So, so think about for a moment. Because once again, just, just listen for a moment. If you and I are the type of people that we focus on the church without knowing the owner of the church, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, Potentially, potentially, you may be in this place and you are so focused on avoiding hell, making sure you make it, make it to heaven, and you disregard that heaven, even though it is a place, heaven is also a person. It's about the person that you will spend eternity with. His name is Jesus. So all that I'm asking you is to think about for a moment, because think about Jewish culture, they were focused on Elijah. I mean, think about it. Elijah was supposed to be the, 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 the precursor, the, the one who prepares the way for Messiah to come. When you think about Jeremiah, Jeremiah is the one that hits the, the Ark of the Covenant, and he's supposed to bring it up for this new age of the Spirit of God. So they're so focused on all these dynamics that are not wrong. Watch this. But you and I know that every single experience, every prophet, every king, every priest in the Old Testament were simply pointing to one single message. His name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is like, you have embraced this, you believe this, you devoted yourself to this, and you keep on missing what these prophets were saying. They were not simply talking about this experience of restoration. Jesus says, I am the restoration. I, see, the restoration of the kingdom is a person. It's not an event. The restoration of the church is not simply that happens called revival. And I'm all for revival. Remember that revival? You know, oh, yeah, yeah, great. It's a person. His name is Jesus. And that's what he's bringing over. Now, now I love, I love what's going to happen because it isn't getting more intimate like this. Now, Simon Peter, because Jesus said, okay, that's what people say. So let me talk to you about you guys. Just intimacy. What, what, who do you say that I am? And look at the answer. You are the Christ, the Messiah. You are not simply the son of the living, not, not only the son of men, but you are the son of the living God. So here's what I want us to kind of close our time and think about as we pray this morning. 
This is the statement that Jesus ultimately will, will use to say upon this statement, upon this manifestation, upon this revelation, which wasn't given to you by flesh or blood, Simon, Peter, I will build my church. So what he's implying is, is based on my character. Now, please listen to me, and, and you've got to pay attention to this. You, you, we're fixing to go. You need to understand how loaded this statement is coming out from the mouth of Peter. And I say loaded because, think about it for a moment. In the Jewish culture, which is what we're describing in here, the Jewish culture was primarily driven in the religious practices, and they were very zealous, they were very devoted to this. The driving force of this culture is literally guilt. So they were very careful to practice with precision all of their sacrificial system experiences. So when, once they sinned, they went and sacrificed. They sinned, they sacrificed. So in the institution of this system, please look at me for a second. Going back to Leviticus, going back to the book of Numbers, they instituted, commanded by God, God spoke to Moses and Moses gave the law. He instituted what is called the Sabbath day, the day of rest. So when Moses, part of the commandment says, you need to take a day off that will be consecrated to me, this is a humongous revolution in the mind of these people in this time in history. A couple of reasons. Number one, in this time in history, which is so foreign to us, right? This is just foreign to us. So please make an effort to stay with me. In this culture, if you did not work, you did not eat. So when you're telling me that out of the seven days, I'm supposed to consecrate one of the seven, which implies I'm going to work six days, and rest one, you're basically telling me that I'm going to go hungry. See, these people didn't know of I'm going and store food for the week. That's a foreign concept. You don't work, you don't eat. And the message of the Sabbath is basically this. Listen to me. Because this is a message that is just like everything I said. This is a system that is pointing towards a person. So when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Peter is implying that even though the Sabbath was necessary and it was practiced by many, many, many generations, these people, they kept on forgetting that true rest is found in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not simply that you need to rest. Because he, let me say this. Ultimately, ultimately, he, he, he's at the point. I believe when you look at the Sabbath experience, us taking a day of rest, the day of rest is conveying to God and conveying to ourselves and conveying to the world that the God that we worship, don't miss this, the God that we worship is able to provide for us seven days out of the week with us working only six Huh? Anybody tracking? The God that we worship can provide for us seven days out of the week with six days of us only worshiping, uh, uh, working. Not only that, but the second part of this conversation of the Sabbath day, it's not just the rest, but it's also the worship of God, right? So we rest and we worship. We rest and we worship. So this is the concept of intimacy, of exalting the the, holy, the holiness of God, the understanding of who God is. And this is why when Peter makes a statement that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Peter is basically saying this. Everything that we have done, everything that we have said, everything that we have practiced, the Sabbath is simply, is simply a picture of a reality. His name is Jesus. Jesus comes and says, I am the fulfillment of that reality. So I told you this last week. I told you last week that we went to the Grand Canyon and we flew over the Grand Canyon over this summer. And it was an amazing experience, beyond comprehension. Now, I told you last week that what made it even more special for me going over the Grand Canyon, it's not just the Grand Canyon, it's who I went with. Huh? Anybody? It's my lady, 18 years on the making. And I told you last week, marriage is not about feeling in love all the time. It's about building a life together. So we have all these memories, right? We have all these things building. Some of them are not very memorable. Some of them we're trying to erase them, but they're still there, right? We built a life together. Please listen to me for a second. Now, if I invited you to come and join us for the picture, and you came on that day and took a picture with us by the helicopter, but I didn't take you into the trip, if I didn't take you on that helicopter and flew over the Grand Canyon, you will say, well, I mean, I'm glad you took the picture, and I'm glad I was in the picture. But you don't really just want the picture. What do you want? 
you want to get in the helicopter, and especially with a person that is meaningful to you, and you want to experience the Grand Canyon on a helicopter. That's what you want. See, what we have done is we have settled for the picture. The picture is the Sabbath. The law is the picture. It's pointing towards a reality that you don't know unless you were married to my wife. You don't know unless you got in that helicopter with my wife and you went to the Grand Canyon. I had the experience. I know what it's like to be with this woman for 18 years. I know what it's like to get in a helicopter and fly over the Grand Canyon because I not only have the memory, I have the reality that I experienced this. Here is what Jesus is saying. I am the reality. Don't settle for the picture. And these Jewish people, they were so enamored with the picture. They wanted to keep the Sabbath. They wanted to worship the Sabbath. And Jesus says, if anybody is weary and tired, come and find rest in me. He's going to model the rest. He's going to go into the graveside for three days and rest. And on the third day, what, what happens? He unleashes the possibility of us having access to worship the God of creation. So for us as a church, our experience of worship is based not on the picture. We have to continue. See, the picture is the reflection of the reality. If Jesus is not building his church, all that we have done is have a picture. I, I'm still, I'm still, I have a present in my mind because this was a, a, a crazy time for me. I remember performing and participating at a quinceañera. And the crazy thing about this quinceañera, which we invest thousands of dollars, is that was the landmark right there that this family that I got involved with and, and we participated in the beautiful quinceañera, beautiful young lady, and this whole thing, it was the landmark that from there they went straight into the courthouse and got divorced. So in my mind, that picture of the quinceañera, and this is just me simplistically without sounding judgmental, to me is a reminder of a divorce. That many marriages will really go through these cultural biases and lenses and preconceived ideas that your kids are supposed to have, fill in the blank, at the expense of the real deal. Not understanding that this quinceañera, what really needed, wasn't really a celebration like that. What, what did she need? She needed the establishment, the, the reality of a marriage, of oneness in the context of marriage and love and forgiveness and restoration. And I'm just afraid that many of us, we embrace the church as a picture, not as a reality. Many of us, we come into places like this because we believe that worship is about me building the church. Worship is about getting things the way I want. Now listen to me for a second. Worship is simply acknowledging that he is a son of man. Worship is acknowledging that this is beyond simply resuscitation. This is about resurrection, a future experience. And worship is about that we still believe the picture is valid. He is simply the fulfillment of the picture. He is the reason why the picture exists. And if we disregard this person, if we disregard this experience, the tragic, the tragic thing for us as a church is that we may be enamored with the picture and not with the reality of Jesus. Now, folks, would you please stand as we pray? As you get on your feet this morning, I will do a disservice to you if I don't tell you what happened to this man, specifically Peter, when he embraced the reality, not just the picture. Have you read verse 17? When you embrace the reality, versus just a picture, listen to the words of Jesus. Blessed are you. I want you to be blessed. I want us to be a blessed generation. I want us to be the church that we experience the blessings, the blessings from God. But we have to be fully aware that we cannot continue to embrace the picture. We have to embrace the experience, the reality that there is a man that walked among us 2,000 years ago. His name is Jesus, and he is still real and powerful. Let's pray together.